Okay, Diana Simone. I, I am a journalist, that's what Sandy was thinking, that's my background. And I also have a nonprofit to stop child trafficking, and I'm a children's book writer. So tonight I am speaking on something I have never spoken about before. If I were speaking on child trafficking, I could talk to you about it with my eyes closed. But this is a whole new uh, subject for me, so I know you'll have lots of grace for me. This uh, came about, uh, I was supposed to go back to Israel in November, December of last year, and it was a program sponsored by Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Center, uh, for specifically for Christians, I'm a Christian, and it was to teach us about the Holocaust, and the, the deal was they were covering everything except for the airfare, and the deal was you were supposed to come home and share what you learned with your community. So Zionistas is my community. So I was already on the books to be um, the speaker tonight when the night before I left, my flight got canceled, and it was a, a series of events that showed me, you know, this is not the time for you to go. So sadly, I, I couldn't go. I, I, I could have rescheduled, but I would have missed a lot of what I was going there for. So I did a lot of the research on my own here, and I hope I got it right, but we, we will find out tonight. So I want to ask how many of you have been to either Yad Vashem in Israel or the Holocaust Center in Washington? Wow, just about everybody, great. Just quickly, I like to ask people what were your, not just your impression, but what was that one defining moment when you walked out that you just couldn't stop thinking about? Just real briefly, a couple of words. Anyone want to share? Sandy? Uh, the train. The train. In Yad Vashem? Right, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. The children's voices. The children's voices. That was, and Linda, that's what you... And also the, the, uh, the avenue of remembering the trees. The righteous, the... Yeah. The Garden of the Righteous is at the Avenue of the Righteous. You've all said my exact ones, yes. Well, for me, the defining moment was definitely the children and hearing the voices and the, the, the Garden or the Avenue of the, the Righteous. But the, the one thing which was an odd thing to remember, I remember coming out, this was at, at Yad Vashem, not in D.C., coming out and coming up that slope and you're just like, gasping in fresh air after what you've seen. And I kept, I heard these words. I was saying to myself, now I understand, now I understand, now I understand. And what I understood was because of this one yellow sign that was part of an exhibit of, you know, in a room of 50,000 other artifacts in just that one room. But that yellow sign in German said Achtung, and it had a, a Star of David, and I, I don't know what else it said. But obviously, it was like all of this I, I knew, like when you, you dream something and you, you know that this is this and this is that. I knew that sign was not from inside a concentration camp. Of course, they would not have had that inside. The people were already there. This was from a, a town or a city, and everybody, could see that sign. It wasn't just Jews walking by and saying, oh, that's for me. It was Christians walking by and saw that. So what I kept saying, now I understand, now I understand, is that when I say to a Jew, oh, those weren't real Christians, that a real Christian wouldn't do that, and suddenly I said, well, those were real Christians. Real Christians did walk by that sign a million times. Real Christians did um, stand out there at Crystal Knocked and see the glass the next morning or hear their neighbors being taken or maybe even turned in their neighbors. So what I, I realized uh, is that there were only three um, responses that people would have had. One was ignorance. They you know, really didn't know what was happening. Second was apathy. They knew, but they didn't really care, it didn't mean anything to them, or those people were just other people. And the third was complicity, that they were behind what happened. And the more research I did, and I'm sure this is what I would have learned at Yad Vashem, the more I saw that 
Christians really were behind so much of what happened, that it was being preached inside the churches, not just not just outside on the of the sidewalks, and certainly not just in the in the camps. So real Christians not only knew what was going on, but were actively participating in it inside the churches. So the title of what I'm sharing tonight is um, you didn't just say that, did you? A Christian response to anti-Semitism. And the, the key word is response. I, I want us, the Christians here, to have a response to what I'm sharing tonight, what we're learning, and I'm, I'm learning it too. So what we're going to cover tonight is my new favorite word, which I'm not going to tell you about what it is right now, a quick look at 1,700 years of history, and I only have about 30 minutes for this whole presentation because I don't want to um, take into Ori's time, and a quick look at one woman who made a huge difference and the man who supported her. So disclaimers. I am not a historian. I like to say I was a French major. I'm going to get a t-shirt emblazoned with that because that will be my excuse for all evils that I commit, all mistakes in my life. I was a French major. A, um, I'm not a theologian. I love God with all my heart. I'm passionate about him, but I'm not a theologian. I am a justice reporter, and someday I'll tell you about how I did a word study on my name. And my name, Diana Simone, means you kind of have to, you know, make it a little bit in there, but it works. It's my name means justice reporter. So my background is fighting injustice, and that's what I'm hoping to do tonight. So I'm going to skip my new favorite word and make you wait on that a little bit. And we're, we're going to do a quick um, about five minutes of 1,700 years of history. And obviously I can't cover everything that happened, so I have chosen four uh, sort of eras or um, markers. And I'd like to ask that you hold your questions and comments until, uh, actually until Ori and I both finish and then we'll have a time of uh, Q&A after that. So our first marker, we're, gonna, we're going to go back in time. We'll start with the Holocaust. I've already mentioned Kristallnacht. And to me that, that is such a, uh, pivotal and graphic example of how people could not have not known what was going on. Did you know, for example, that Kristallnacht occurred on the night of a full moon? So I don't know if the Nazis chose that on purpose or if it just happened that way or that they knew moons were important in Judaism, whatever. To me, the idea of that moon shining on that crystal was was so made it so visible. It had to have been the crystal on the glass. It had to have been that visible for people to call it crystal. Um, the churches at that time were actively preaching in favor of what was happening outside on the streets. In fact, this was accepted theology. It was so accepted that when uh, I read about one uh, theologian who wrote a book that today you practically be in prison for hate crimes, and nobody even blinked an eye because this was already accepted theology. I want to read you from a book, a two-minute warning. Uh, the Burdettes let me, many of the books I'm reading from tonight. Um, you may not have heard of the book, but you I know you've heard of Coach Bill McCartney. He was the coach of uh, University of Colorado football team. And when he stepped down from coaching, he started an organization called Promise Keepers, which was groups of men uh, meeting in cities, filling stadiums, even going to Washington, D.C. So he later stepped down from that, and he is now actively supporting Israel and teaching Christians their uh, Jewish roots. So he wrote a book called Two Minute Warning. Okay, after Hitler committed suicide, he was honored and commemorated for his life and work by the church. Cardinal Bertram sent out an order to the churches in his archdiocese in May 1945. He proclaimed that a solemn requiem mass to be held in honor of the Fuhrer, quote, so that his and Hitler's flock could pray that the Almighty's son, Hitler, be admitted to paradise. 
Now you could construe that and say, well, maybe they meant, you know, this guy would hopefully still get into heaven and that God would forgive him. I don't, I don't think that was the meaning of that at all. They were saying this wonderful son of, of uh, the Almighty, uh, pray for his, his entrance into heaven. So this is, this is a cardinal. Um, and it was both the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. On and on, many, many examples of this you could find. So um, I did an article in um, Charisma Magazine in October, and I have copies of it up here for you. And I interviewed a filmmaker named Vanessa Frank who did um, a film about Martin Luther, who we will look at in our next marker. And here's what she said. This was a direct quote. Hitler said he was only continuing what the church had been doing for 1,500 years. Many historians recognize that what went on in World War II would not have happened if people had not been indoctrinated that one of the most influential people of their nation, Luther, taught the persecution of Jews. That's the culture in which World War II was able to take place. <clears throat> now, I want it, that's pretty horrific. As I'm giving you these benchmarks, I want to also give you a little bit of hope and some, some good stories in there. Another book I read is called The Pastor's Barracks. And this, it's a novel, but it's based on actual characters, uh, pastors who were imprisoned in Dachau. And uh, Dachau apparently had, uh, it had a pastor's barrack, and these were pastors who refused to go along with the Nazis, and they were either killed or imprisoned because of it. And Dachau actually had 10% 10, 10 of the people who were in there were either pastors or priests who, who isn't, so it's good, good to hear some, some uh, <clears throat> good stories too. So we're moving quickly along to our next benchmark or marker which is Martin Luther and he lived from 1483 to 1546. Now we have to give him credit for what he got right. For most of his life he, he got it right. He reformed many great abuses that were happening in the church for, for centuries. He um, revolutionized what had become accepted church theology. He insisted that the Bible says we receive salvation from God, not by works, but by God's grace alone, by, by God's grace alone through faith. He was in prison because he fought for the right of people to read the Bible in their own language. He fought the papacy because of its oppression against Jews. Well, all that, sadly, turned around in the last three years of his life he turned against Jews himself and wrote a 65,000 word, that's a pretty hefty word, uh, length book called The Jews and Their Lies. And you can still find it on Amazon. He called Jews, and these are uh, direct quotes. Stupid fools, miserable, blind, senseless, thieves, robbers, and vermin. He, <clears throat> he urged authorities to, quote, eject them, forever from this country, do not grant them protection or safe conduct, end of quote. He openly urged Christians, this, I mean, you would be arrested today for hate crimes, and this book was, was published and uh, welcomed. Uh, he openly urged Christians, quote, first to set fire to synagogues or schools, to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn, so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord, so that God might see that we are Christians, as if that would make you a Christian. Second, I advise that their houses be razed and destroyed, and it, it goes on and on. So uh, 500 years in our first marker, when Vanessa Frank said, it was accepted theology, this, this is what was accepted theology. So when we say that the Holocaust did not happen in a vacuum, this is why Calvin, who came, I think about 100 years later, maybe not quite that long, had very similar words. So remember, Hitler said he was only continuing what the church had been doing for 1,500 years. So in the interest of time, we're going to skip massive uh, points of um, Christian persecution against Jews, the 
pogroms, the um, Inquisition, Crusades, forced conversions, on and on. You could do an entire um, uh, semester of, of talking about this. But we're, we're going to jump all the way back to about the 4th century in the 300s with Constantine. Constantine was an emperor of the Roman Empire, and it was a time of great persecution against Christians. He actually converted and became a Christian and instituted some good reforms. Again, we'll give him a little bit of credit. He outlawed infanticide, outlawed the abuse of slaves and peasants, and crucifixion. Yet, the church he converted to was not the church that was already growing in Jerusalem at this time, that had Jewish roots and culture, as we'll see in a minute. The church he converted to was the paganized Christianity of Rome and Alexandria, which had no um, friendship towards Jews. So that's where the shift happened, where uh, Christians lost their Jewish roots and in fact were forbidden to follow them. And now we'll do our fourth marker, which was the early Christian church. And the early church was almost 100% Jewish. Remember, Jesus or Yeshua was Jewish. So they were following him, so they did not convert to Christianity. There was no Christianity then. They, they remained Jewish. They kept the feast. They followed all the customs. And Judaism was the part and parcel of early Christianity, even though that term wasn't used yet. <clears throat> Jesus, or Yeshua, celebrated all the feasts. You can find them throughout the New Testament. It's so interesting to read a translation that uses the right words instead of saying uh, Jesus went to supper, saying Yeshua went to the Passover, and then, oh, it was a Passover. It wasn't the Last Supper. So, uh, if they were following him, they did what he did, which meant they didn't give up their Jewishness. They remained Jewish. In fact, Gentiles, when Gentiles started being interested in what was happening, the, the uh, Jews weren't sure what to do with these, these Gentiles who wanted to come in and join them, so they had a um, council to decide what, what to do. So, the Gentiles were the ones who were actually converted. Um, so again, the early church was, was Jewish, but that, those roots, as you could see in 300 with, with Constantine, completely got skewed. So now we're going to go back to the future, to today. And for those of us who are blessed to live in Florida, and we can stand outside and watch uh, a space shuttle or a rocket launch, a Delta rocket launch go out, we know, we, how many times have you stood out in your driveway watching on your phone, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and they stop at 3, and the whole thing is shut down until a week later. Why? Because one little tiny thing went wrong, and the trajectory that might must was supposed to be here was just, I mean, you can't even see the little bit. It was off because of what went wrong. So if they had let that rocket go up, by the time it got to the moon, it would have been on its way to Pluto, never, you know, not heading at all where it was supposed to be. So the whole thing about when it starts off wrong way down here, by the time it gets up here, so you, you see where I'm going with this. So that's where we are today. One of the ways where anti-Semitism affects the Christian church today, you, you could talk to people who would say, I don't hate Jews, I'm not against Israel. But you would, you would ask them, well, do you believe, you, you could ask them, do you believe in replacement theology, and they wouldn't know what you were saying. But if you ask them the definition of replacement theology, if they believed in that, they would say yes. Replacement theology is taught from many, many, many churches, Christian churches in the world today. And what it means is that it has taken all the promises in the Bible, God's covenant with the Jews, God's promises to the Jews, God's blessing to the Jews, and said, no, that's not accurate anymore. God has given them to the church, the promises, the blessing, the covenant. I mean, it, it doesn't even make sense because if you follow that again with a trajectory, if you follow 
that line of thinking. Well, if, if God is that, you know, whimsical that he could change his mind on that, well, he could change his mind on, on anything, and that doesn't exactly sound like who I would like to follow. So if, brought, if God broke his covenant with the Jews, he could break his word with, with anybody. So here is a quote that I have in my Charisma article from the head of the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, which I believe is the only embassy in Jerusalem. Is that right, Linda? All, all countries, including ours, have their embassy in Tel Aviv because they don't recognize Jerusalem as the capital. So ICEJ has been there, I believe, for 60 years, something like that, and they're, they're the ones who sponsor the big Feast of Tabernacles and, and um, uh, invite Christians to come over to that and to participate in the Jerusalem March. So here's what he said about replacement theology. For centuries, this was the prevailing view in most of the established churches of Europe. Any contrary outlook was brutally silenced. And then he talked about in 1589, a clergyman named Francis Kett, who um, was actually burned at the stake for preaching other than res um, replacement theology. So uh, you can see how that opens the door for anti-Semitism in the church. That's just one example of it today. Um, the, the Bible, the, I will say about the New Testament, is not foundationally anti-Semitic. I, I went to a Bible study once where the teacher said, you could make the Bible say anything you want by, by taking uh, scriptures out of context. But the New Testament tells Christians you are to honor Jews, you're to honor Israel, you, we owe a great debt to you. So those, those are the, the scriptures that um, uh, we're, we're to follow. So I mentioned the um, title of this message, and I know I haven't gotten to my favorite word yet. The title is Response, Response of Christians to Anti-Semitism. What do we do with this information? We, we, I'm sorry, you can't, you're not ignorant anymore. If you were ignorant when you walked in, you just heard all these horrible examples. So you could be apathetic, you could be complicit, or you could be an activist, and you could be my new favorite word, which is audacious. And in fact, I wrote a book called Audacious because I just love this word. talk and turn to the right page. This um, is a quote from the head of a large anti-trafficking organization. He said, ending human trafficking is not idealistic or naive, it is audacious. And it is people of audacity who change the world. And I told you that I'm a justice reporter. It's not just about child trafficking, it's about other issues of injustice, including the one we're talking about tonight. So what I say about child traffickers applies to people who hate Jews and who, who actively work to destroy Israel. And that is that if child traffickers are a 10 on the audacious scale, we have to be an 11 to stop them. So I would like to encourage us all tonight to be 11 on the audacious scale for the issue of justice that we're talking about. And here is the definition of audacious. Extremely bold or daring, recklessly brave and fearless, bold in defiance of convention. I mean, don't you love the idea that you have permission to be defiant? So you could be recklessly bold in defiance of convention and brazen. That's my commission to you. And I want to briefly talk about a woman who to me is the, the poster child of audacity, and that is Esther, or Hadassah. I don't have time to retell her story, but I encourage you to retell it. I know we're celebrating Purim next month, which is her, her uh, story. And a lot of that sometimes gets lost in the, you know, waving the noisemakers, and every time Haman's name is mentioned, and the kids dressing up and all of that, which is wonderful and adorable, but don't miss the story of what 
this little orphan girl who became a queen did. And when I was uh, writing Audacious, I, I was reading the book of Esther in the Bible, and it's only, it's, I mean, it's exactly six pages in my Bible. It takes about 20 minutes to read, so I encourage you to read it. But as I was, was reading it, as I was reading it, I began to write down or just highlight, wow, this is, this is showing God's heart for justice over and over. And I came up with 40-something um, aspects of God's heart for justice, which are, of course, in the book. Okay, here are just some of them. <clears throat> God isn't scared by the odds. One, God's justice isn't scared by the odds. One person plus God equals the best odds, because she, she was there, her, she and her cousin Mordecai. Uh, God's justice not only rights wrongs, but in the process dismantles entire structures that are propping them up, political, cultural, legal, and more. God's justice always leads to freedom. A couple of more I wrote down here. God uses women to fight injustice. We appreciate all our Zionistos, but this was originally an organization called Zionistas. It's, it still is. We love having the Zionistos come. Please don't stop coming. But the, it's the story, Esther is the story of a woman who, who changed the world and saved her people. God uses Mordecais to help the Esthers. So I want to thank the Mordecais who have constantly helped Zionistas, particularly Alan and David. Where is David, David? We have two Mordecais here who have just been so encouraging to us as Esther, so we appreciate you both. Um, <clears throat> it can look like all hope is lost, but God can turn that around, and he can do it in a single day in a 24-hour period. I mean, it, when you read the story and kind of timeline it and see what happened in 24 hours when the decree had already been issued by the king to kill every Jew in his kingdom, which stretched from India to Ethiopia. And in 24 hours, this decree was turned around. And the, and the decree, when a king made the decree, it could not be reversed, but, but God. <clears throat> Um, so it can look like all hope is lost, but God can turn that around. God isn't scared by odds. God plus one person equal a majority. Um, being audacious does not mean we need to have a, a huge group of people working together. It can be one person or two people, like Esther and, and her cousin. It can be Zionistas which is not quite as large as APAC or other, some other organizations, but we're pretty powerful. I want to tell you about a um, woman I met in Thailand when I had gone there uh, for, to stop child trafficking. And she was from the Netherlands, and she had built a safe house where young girls, not little girls, but like teenagers, who had come out of uh, child trafficking were living. And there were maybe 20 of them. I had dinner with them, and they were like, you know, girls anywhere, shy at first, and then you couldn't shut them up. And then the woman who, whose name I have now forgotten took me out to uh, the garden, which was mud and, you know, sticks and, and brush, and she's looking at it with eyes like she was seeing Manhattan, and she's describing to me this new building that she's about to build. And it's going to have 12 more beds. And I'm looking at her, listening to her, and looking at the mud, and it was like, does not compute, does not compute. So I finally said to her, how do you keep, because knowing what was outside the safe house, thousands and thousands and thousands of women and children and boys and men being forced into trafficking, and she had 12 more beds she was wanting to, to, um, to make a, a house for. Now, I'm a big picture person, so the 12 beds would just drive me absolutely crazy, but that wasn't even just that. It was, 
how do you keep from losing hope? That's what I said to her. And she looked at me now like I was the crazy one. She goes, it's not about numbers. It's never been about numbers. She looked right at me and she said, if you do what you're supposed to do and I do what my, I'm supposed to do, the job will get done. And then she went on to the next task. And I'm like, okay, you're right about that. So that's what for us is our commission. If you do what you're supposed to do and I do what I'm supposed to do and we partner with God to do it, we can dismantle this injustice of anti-Semitism in the church. Um, I want to just briefly end with a little bit of high notes about some of the um, activities that you may not know are going on around the world in, uh, among Christian groups that are working actively to protect Jews now and in the future if anything uh, continues to happen, which it probably will, and uh, working to protect Israel. Uh, there are groups that pray every single day for an hour for your protection. Um, there are people such as me who have on their phone an alarm for 6 p.m. on uh, Sunday evening, uh, and we pray Psalm 27 and Psalm 83 over Israel. Does anyone else do that? You can you can um, sign up. You don't, there's nothing to even sign up. You just do it. I, I set my my phone for 6 p.m. Psalm 27 and Psalm 83 over Israel and over Florida. Um, prayer letters. I mean, my inbox and my mailbox every day I get a uh, something from another organization that is actively working to protect Israel. ICEJ, which I've already mentioned, the International Christian Embassy. The prayer movement, the HOPs, the Houses of Prayer, these are, remember David, way, way, way back when, had the 24-7 uh, tent going with worship because he was a worshiper. And how many years did that go on? Was it Anyone know? I don't, I don't remember, but it, it was 24-7 it was prayer. So this has recently been kind of resurrected all around the world, and there are houses of prayer, including one right here in Orlando, that go 24-7, not praying not just about Israel, but about many, many uh, needs. But we have one here in, in Orlando, and there are, there are at least... When I went to Israel, there were three. There are probably more now. I went went to one, which was right on Mount Zion, met the head of another one, and, and there's a third one someplace. Uh, David's tent, is that still in? It, this is, again, going back to David. This is set up in D.C., right across from the White House, in, in the on the ellipse, between the White House and the Washington Monument, there's a white tent, I saw it over Christmas, and there are young worshipers from all over the country who are there 24-7 for, is it 40 days? Carolyn, do you know how long, Lorraine, Sharon? I don't know, they've been there for a couple of months on this stint. So they're, they're praying for the United States, but they're also praying for Israel. The Jerusalem March, I mentioned, thousands and thousands of Christians from all over the world show up and march through the streets. I, I did that, and people are looking at you like, wow, we didn't know we had this much support. The Feast of Tabernacles, who caught uh, Christians from all over the world come to Israel to support Israel. And then three things I'm just going to give you sketchy details on because this is being recorded, but uh, safe houses. A lot of Christians have prepared safe houses to help Jews if and when uh, we have another Holocaust, even here in the United States. And they're in the United States as well as in other countries. Uh, I've heard of even underground caves that have been completely outfitted with uh, supplies to uh, hide Jews if the need comes. And um, I uh, heard a woman speak about uh, she is, is part of a movement that is getting ships and boats prepared to ferry Christians out of the country. I, and I think it's not just in the U.S., but, but in other countries, uh, to get Jews to safety in Israel if, if the need comes. 
So these are people who are 11 on the audacious scale. So my challenge to you is that Esther said yes to being audacious. She was in 11, and will you be in 11 at audacious also? Thank you.